And welcome to today's session on sex and sexuality in the era of Love Island. My name is Saba, I'm a member of the Socialist Workers Party in West London and I'll be chairing this session today. Our speaker is Sarah Bates who is a journalist at Socialist Worker and a member of the SWP in East London. Sarah will speak for about 35 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Saba. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a bit of audience participation, nothing too weird. Um, but I just want people to raise their hands if they've ever seen Love Island. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so I, I think that's probably just over half the audience. Okay, brilliant. Um, so unless you've been living under a rock uh, over the last few years, uh, you will have heard about Love Island. It's been a kind of complete huge success. It's the most watched TV programme on ITV2 ever. Um, and interestingly, I think, it's also the most watched programme for people in their 16 to 24 age demographic. Um, we're not having this meeting at Marxism uh, just because I'm obsessed with reality TV, although I am, like I am obsessed with uh, reality TV. But I think actually Love Island, I think it's, it's, um, it's success, but even the fact that it exists shows us something about human sexuality today, about human sexuality under capitalism. And part of what I want to say today is that, like everything else, uh, how people form relationships and express their sexual identity is profoundly shaped by how society functions and the dominant ideas in it. And actually, I want to argue uh, that Love Island reflects a wider process in capitalism where parts of our human nature are repackaged and sold back to us and in particular, this process is one shaped by uh, women's, women's uh, uh, oppression. So for those that haven't seen it, uh, Love Island is a reality TV programme where very, very glamorous people uh, live in a villa uh, for seven weeks. And the central premise is uh, that these individuals are kind of, they, they enter into romantic pairs. So they enter into, they enter into couples um, to compete, to win a prize. Of fifty thousand pounds, and that's uh, that, you know that's that's uh, that's the prize. Um, so this kind of plays out in some, I think, fairly predictable ways. Uh, so romantic love or attention or even kind of uh, friendship become currency between individuals, and the contestants know the public are watching them at all points. Um, so a sort of performative element. Uh, enters into kind of these, these, this behaviour and these, and these relationships. And the, cont uh, the contestants also know that it's the public who will ultimately decide who wins the 50,000 prize. So actually the idea that you present yourself as kind of most in love with your partner uh, kind of plays out. I mean, you can see some of the ways that this plays out in Love Island in some quite sad ways, actually. So Montana, a contestant from two years ago, was, was voted to remain in the villa by, um, by the public. And she, she described how she thinks the audience would feel relieved and that they had to see her deliver the goods after she kissed, after she kissed another contestant. Um, and part of the process um, is that this is them, they literally line up and pick each other. This is, this is what happens. Um, part, part of this process is the contestants engage in challenges um, and if they win they get um, you know, de dates with their couple, they go for a meal or something like that or they get a, a, a night in a private room uh, covered in cameras, um, ironically called the hideaway um, <laughs> and the, <laughs> the only thing it's got in it is a bed. Um, so this is, what, this is a challenge from last week that I think is probably quite a good example of, of what's going on on Love Island. You know, there's women uh, in this sort of archetypal playboy bunny outfits, um, and they had to do like fitness, they had to do like fitness challenges. So they were like literally running on a treadmill in these. They had to like eat a carrot without using their hands and stuff like that. Um, all the men remained fully clothed, by the way. Um, they didn't have to wear, uh, they didn't have to wear one of these outfits. So, 
it is obviously an incredibly, you know, sexualized environment for people uh, for people to be living in. And actually, these sexual standards are so precise, they're so exacting that if you fall foul of it in any way, you pay for it. So, like Maura, this year, she was uh, she was judged harshly by other contestants, men, by the way. She was judged harshly for even talking too much about sex. They thought she discussed sex too much, um, and and kind of uh, criticized criticised for it. Um, these pressures, I think, are sharper for women, but they exist for men as well. I mean, last season we saw the... Um the, they called it the do bit society, right? Like ch like children. So this is this was the men in the show, and they created the do bit. So do bits. They're talking about sexual acts. That's what they mean. They just clearly can't even describe it. They can't even use the words. So they would get together every morning and talk about what bits they had done the night before, <laughs> what kind of sex they'd have, and the ones that weren't having sex got basically bullied, like by the other the other men. Um, Love Island is not the only TV programme, I think, that reflects wider ideas um, about sexuality and love, you know, first date, blind date, dinner date, they've all got the don't word date in it, it's weird. Um, most of us probably haven't seen this, Naked Attraction. Comrades, I watched it, so you didn't have to. I watched it. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, where do you go from here? <laughs> I checked with the organisers and I was allowed this. It's fine. <laughs> right, OK, so this, this is a TV programme that promises a daring dating series that starts where some good dates end <laughs> naked. So, essentially, what they do is um, people... Well, you know, it's pretty self explanatory in lots of ways. They, they raise this kind of uh, partition to see uh, different parts of their naked body, obviously ending with the face. And then... What actually, the way this actually plays out is there's like a person just discussing another person's body parts, like completely divorced from their sense of personhood, you know, completely divorced from the fact that they're kind of even a human being, you know, they discuss them like they're sort of vegetables in a shop, um, and really is quite a sort of like an edifying sight actually. Um, but of course for most people, looking for love is not like that, it might look uh, something like this. Um, the, there's been a huge um, you know, boost in like, people uh, joining dating apps, uh, websites and things like that. There's over 1,500 uh, different dating apps or websites. And this is, a real, this is a really recent development actually and I think it's fundamentally changing how people kind of meet and, re and relate to each other and things like that. So between 2013 and 2015, a period of just two years, online dating usage tripled for those between 18 and 24. And the same time period, the number of 55 to 64 year olds uh, doubled. It's quite a, similar, quite a similar format in most of them. Uh, you see a person's profile picture and that entire individual's life, you know, their, all their experiences, their qualities, uh, their characteristics, they're essentially reduced to two or three pieces of information, actually, and they're mostly kind of the photo, obviously, uh, and then name, age, uh, sometimes how far away they are from you, um, so you know how quickly uh, you can get to them. <laughs> Um, and one of the most popular is OkCupid, okay and OkCupid, okay uh, you know, their tagline is dating deserves better. And OkCupid okay tells us, on OkCupid, okay you're more than just a photo. Get noticed for who you are, not what you look like. Um, this is what you're presented with when you, when you look on OkCupid, okay which I would argue is actually still quite a lot about um, what you look like, really, uh, rather than sort of who you are. Um, so, in, in this process, it streams you straight away, actually. It asks you a series of kind of like 10, 10, um, t 10 questions, uh, and, you know, it get, starts to give you potential matches uh, based on who it thinks you're likely to get on with. Um, I mean, it, 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 they streamline you so quickly, it actually gives you a match percentage, a numerical percentage, uh, to let you know how, how likely you are to get on with some, someone. So actually, this kind of like this romance, you know, people call it the spark, this idea that you can have a connection with someone that you can't quite articulate, you can't quite explain... Yeah. Why it is so much? Why it is you feel like it, it, you know um, you feel that way? 
it actually becomes this completely binary, instantaneous decision based, I would argue, essentially uh, on how people look. So people go kind of shopping for partners the same way that they would go shopping for a pair of jeans. But instead of sort of doing the tick box on what colour they might want, a size or cut of jeans, they're starting to look at human beings and thinking, actually, what age... What age do I want? What height? What education level? You know, you can decide all these things and many, many more. So all the different dating websites, they've got different ways of making money. Uh, some just use a straight up subscription service like Match.com. You pay a monthly fee. It's not cheap, by the way. It's £30 uh, in Britain. Other give you extra services if you cough up cash. They kind of entice you uh, by saying you're more likely to be noticed by people will boost you up the ranking if you give them extra money. Tin Tinder, for instance, gives you unlimited swipes uh, for a certain amount of time. Um, but it starts to get actually uh, creepier from here, I think. So um, date that there's a dating app called Coffee Meets Bagel. And if you spend money on Coffee Meets Bagel, you can buy something called an activity report. And that activity report gives you information on the person you're speaking to. So you can you for money, you can find out things like how often they're on the website, uh, how likely they are to, to send the first message, um, and so on. You can buy all this information uh, uh, like that. Um, I actually think this is the future of dating uh, right here, <laughs> because <laughs> actually services have become so streamlined now, they're kind of trying to remove the human element at all. So uh, something called Bernie was invented. Nothing to do with Bernie Sanders, I just couldn't think of another picture. But um, <laughs> so, so, um, someone called, uh, something called Bernie uh, was invented. Um, it was a plug-in for Tinder. It was live for several years. Um, and... This, this is a plugin that actually watches how you swipe, whether you say yes or no to people, and then you leave it and it makes decisions for you. It starts to swipe yes or no on other human people and starts to talk to them uh, for you. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's actually terrifying. And it was invented by a man, by the way, who got too bored of swiping on women. Do you know what I mean? Like the laziest person alive. Um, <laughs> And he, the founder said that the future of dating is my Bernie will talk to your Bernie. You know, like, humans don't have to be involved in this process at all. And I think with these kinds of initiatives, it's actually incredible that anyone is kind of having sex at all. Um, so how do we understand this kind of development in how uh, people relate to each other and talk? Um, now, I'm seamlessly going to go into Karl Marx now, as you, as you noticed that. Brilliant. Um, of course, Marx did it right, did he? He didn't write about Love Island. Uh, and he didn't write about OK Cupid. But I actually think his writing uh, gives us a really useful framework for understanding, for understanding these uh, phenomenons. Um, because Marx argued, um, he looked at how people uh, uh, related to each other, and he said that actually... Under capitalist society, people have very little control over their lives. They have very little control um, over themselves in lots of ways and very little control over their labour. And this process creates distorted relationships between individuals and a distorted relationship uh, with yourself. And Marx said that actually we're alienated from other people because under capitalism... We, we primarily connect to other individuals through buying and selling of commodities we produce, the buying and selling of goods. And we're encouraged to see each other, aren't we, as kind of extensions uh, of capitalism. And we live in a society that actually, I think, doesn't really nourish individuals. It doesn't really develop uh, people. And our abilities and needs are converted simply into a way of making money. And let's be honest, they are making money off it. Uh, Love Island had 26 different sponsorship deals last year. It is so popular that ITV have changed the way they, they do sponsorship. Um, and I think actually Love Island reflects this alienation uh, that Marx talked about. And rather, you know, bonds between individual being based, uh, you know, on, on coming together and, and uh, equality... Love Island is actually about a partner literally being your property. You know, unless you are owned by another individual in that villa, you'll you stand a very good chance of being ousted from the show and you certainly won't win. It's completely all about control. It's about possession of each other. 
I think it's really easy to look around the world and see in lots of ways how bosses make profits off our most basic human needs, you know, surrounding food, clothing, shelter, and so on. But what about the needs that are sometimes more difficult to articulate? For instance, something like the wellness industry. I, th I think the concept of wellness is, rather than health, uh, is actually a very recent thing, but it's, it's estimated at four trillion pounds. So to make yourself feel well in body or mind, you can go to a spa day, or you could go to a fitness gym, or maybe you could spend it on something like millionaire actor Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop. And this, this, <laughs> this is something that brand, brands itself, the modern lifestyle brand that offers cutting edge wellness. By the way, when I was doing the research for this, I looked on Goop and <laughs> the first article was like, nine crystals you need to keep at your get desk. Um, so that's the kind of quality content they've got. But, but on, Goop, on Goop, you can buy things uh, such as the 10 day detox supplement kit. You know, it's a snip at just £100 um, and it promises a cleanse that has never been so easy to swallow. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> we could use another example. This is Marie Kondo with her favourite book. Um, so I think actually the success of Marie Kondo, I, I don't know who's seen it, but the success of Marie Kondo on Netflix, uh, she's someone who's built a, huge, a wildly successful global brand um, on housework. Um, so domestic labour and housework, it, it becomes something not just that you have to endure, like, and you just have to do to kind of exist and live, but it's something that you can pay for tidy experts, hundreds or thousands of pounds, by the way, who come to your house and they show how to spark joy through the magic of tidying. That's her phrase, sparking joy. Um, you know, or we could look at the businesses that sprung up around our human need to connect with nature, to, to connect with the world around us. You know, we've got companies that offer forest bathing, they call it forest bathing, that promises the medicine of nature. You know, you could pay a thousand pounds to hire a cabin with a hot tub, luxury toilets, flat screens, and a coffee machine. That's that's reconnecting with nature. <laughs> so everything you know we need as human beings, or everything we want, can be reduced uh, to a product. So it's no surprise to me that there is uh, a huge market that is kind of built and structured around this need for relationships and for sexual uh, expression. In fact, the the, the concept that there is a such thing as a dating industry, a love industry, you know, a sex industry, the fact that they even exist shows us how part of ourselves have been commodified. And in this process, you actually become part of the product, don't you? You're not just the consumer, you become part of the product. For instance, uh, eHarmony rejects applicants who have been married too many times, won't let you join, thinks it will ruin your product. Um, it also, someone's just said, that's too many times. <laughs> Um, or it will reject you if when you fill out your questionnaire it shows, uh, it indicates you might be depressed, they won't let you join uh, because you ruin their kind of things, it might ruin your uh, success rate so something that is so personal to us uh, and so intrinsic is being decided by algorithms, by computer algorithms and these formulas and bosses looking to make money and this kind of love industry is exactly the same as other parts of capitalism I would say because we're made, to, we're made to feel through these websites like we're being given this kind of bespoke personal treatment. No, I'm not trying to make us find my soulmate. That's really nice. Um, but actually, um, most, most of the dating apps are owned by one company. Match.com owns Tinder. It owns um, OkCupid. It owns Match. Um, and actually, it owns 60 other websites um, that actually work... They, the, some of them are quite um, bespoke, like I said, and they're like they're put up to kind of create this illusion of an exclusive product. Uh, but actually, it's the same as as everything else. But I think we can take this argument even further, and we can look how sex is used uh, as a as a tool uh, to sell other commodities. Actually. This is an advert for a pair of socks. <laughs> she seems to really be enjoying them, I don't know. <laughs> um, like, honestly, when I was doing the research for this, this is American Apparel, by the way. When I was doing the research for this meeting, I came across so, so much uh, kind of stuff like, stuff like this. You could, you could do a whole meeting on it. Um, or this is an advert oh. for a suit. That's an advert for a suit. Oh. Um, or this is, this is a personal favourite of mine. Yeah. This is the M&M yeah. yeah. advert. Where the, pre the premise of the M&M adver advert is, 
this is so good you will want to have sex with it. So I would have liked to have been inside that marketing meeting. Um, uh, but, you know, off, often in these, I think um, this advert kind of shows it the best, I feel. Um, women are just kind of like these passive objects, aren't they? You know, they don't have a voice. A lot of the time they actually kind of don't have a face. Uh, you know, they're constantly sexualised, but they're never seen as, as, as people. They're never seen as having a sexual identity of their own, you know, the ability to make their own decisions and have their own agency. And this objectification for some people, actually, this process, this sexual objectification of women is completely natural. In fact, it's so natural, it's hardwired into our brains. For the authors of a book on pornography called A Billion Dirty Thoughts, they said, they literally said, men's brains are designed to objectify females. And the way they explain this is they say the shape and curves of female bodies indicate how many years of healthy child-rearing remain across a woman's entire lifetime. I mean, honestly. Um, I hardly need to say, do I, that this ignores the huge variant in human sexual behaviour, including LGBT plus relationships, older or younger couples, those who aren't interested in having children, and actually so on. You know, I feel like it, it ignores uh, you know, most people, actually. Um, and actually, uh, people's, um, you know, their, their sexual identity and behaviour changes throughout your, your lifetime, doesn't it? Why would it stay the same? Everything else... Uh, changes uh, throughout your life. This isn't reflected on things like Love Island. You know, they they will they will talk endlessly about my type. That's like one of the things they say. Oh, you know, he's my type, or they're not my type, or my type on paper. You know, that like my uh, yeah, those are watching it are laughing because it's like it's something they always say. My type on paper. But I would say actually. A lot of them are quite interchangeable, yeah. I would say. I mean, th this was the starting cast, but like there's, there's, loads, there's loads more now, and they basically all look the same. And I think this kind of reflects wider idea about what is sexy and who is allowed to be sexy. Um, because all the contestants are under 28. Most of them are much younger. So most of them are sort of 22, 23. They basically look very similar. And like, let's just be honest, it's small, thin women and big, muscly men. That's basically it. Um, and these, this is exact, exacting, uh, exacting standards for contestants. Previous contestants in previous years have talked about, as a result of being on the show, actually getting surgery from the amount of bullying and harassment they received, but it, it impacts on the viewers too. Uh, the Mental Health Foundation did a, did, did a survey into this and they found that 24% of young people said reality TV made them worry about their body image. Um, and Love Island, you know, they responded to this, fair enough. They, they responded to it and, and this, was their, this was their response. So the creative director... <laughs> Creative director said, yeah, we want to be as representative as possible, but we also want them to be attracted to each other. I mean, I kind of feel like that says all we need to know <laughs> about what they think of us, <laughs> normal people. So presumably only people with kind of no cellulite and six packs have the ability to be attracted to each other. And one thing that often comes up in discussions around Love Island and representation is the fact that most, most of them are white. Um, uh, the, the treatment of black people on the show has kind of been pulled up time and again. And the treatment of black women in particular. Uh, Samira from last year just went through a pretty awful experience, actually, uh, and, and uh, you know, of, not, of kind of not being uh, picked. And, um, you know, it was, in, it, was in the news, it was in the news quite a lot. And this is something that is reflected in the sort of dating world uh, in, in general, I would say. And racism is, is actually rife on online dating. I mean, I sound very critical, but I don't actually think dating apps or websites are necessarily a bad thing. I think it's great that people have the space to be able to communicate uh, their sexuality and to meet people. And for most people, th these are safe spaces uh, for most of the time. But it's not a safe space for everyone. Because, you know, people suffer from everything from outright racist abuse to some more subtle prejudices. There's lots of research that kind of backs, backs this up. Research shows that black men and women are ten times more likely to message a white person than the other way around. And actually people are fetishised based on stereotypes about their ethnicity. And this is something that you see a lot in pornography. I just want to touch on pornography briefly because I feel like it's, it's a cornerstone of debates around sex and sexuality. Uh, this is the most popular website, Pornhub. They say they get 64 million hits every day. 
Uh, in Britain, 55% of young men said watching porn was their primary source of sex education. But for me, it sums it up uh, when someone said to me, porn takes the sexiness out of sex. Here, this is sex. This is sex scrub clean of any intimacy or anything that makes it interesting, any sense of connection. Because at the end of the day, what we're watching is manufactured desire. Um, and it reduces human sexuality, uh, all the fun, all the pleasure, all the messiness. It, it, it just uh, uh, it reduces it into just a series of acts. Uh, uh, a series of acts. Let's not forget as well that the people making these films, uh, they don't want you to be having sex. They want to hook you in with sometimes with more explicit and extreme content. They want to keep you in your bedroom watching their goods rather than actually going out and having sex uh, yourself. It's not just changing the way people have sex, although it is. It's also changing the shape of their bodies. There's an alarming uh, rise in genital surgeries for women as women try and mimic what they see uh, on screen. So young women are left to understand their own body through highly glamorised, edited uh, and sexualised imagery. So when I, uh, when I talked about society shaping uh, sexuality earlier, uh, what did I mean? Um, so I, I, uh, I, well, this, this is what I mean. <laughs> so, uh, Marx, uh, he talked about how actually individual, family, social needs are subordinated to the mar market and reshaped. We reshape these needs in order to serve the needs of capital. That sounds a bit out of line. What did Marx mean by this? Well, I think one of the clearest and one of the most important, especially in terms of sexuality, is in the nature of the family. And the family plays a really vital role in regulating uh, these relationships. You can see the influence of the family in when politicians uh, espouse the virtues of a kind of traditional family uh, unit. That plays a part. But people's lives are, fu are fundamentally shaped by their material uh, reality. You know, we can, ugh, you could go on about this forever, you know. You see it in so many different ways. Uh, the fact that people have to share childcare, don't they? The fact that rents and mortgages are kind of set at a level that two or more people uh, are, are able uh, to, to, to afford. <coughs> you also see it in echoes of, of things like Love Island, you know, this obsession with finding kind of a long-term monogamous relationship. I think that there's a reason why Love Island is called Love Island and not like casual Sex Island, or seven, well, seven Weeks of Fun Island, because I actually don't think they could get away with that. I think they have to call it uh, Love Island. And the wider language we use around uh, sex and sexuality, you know, my other half, my soulmate, my true love, the one, you know, things like that, this all kind of implies that we're not like a full, complete person, you know, without, uh, without this other uh, person. And of course, uh, pressures of life come out in relationships, don't they? And the pressure to be everything at all times, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, to your partner uh, ha ha has uh, an Im impact. And the idea that actually everyone wants this kind of relationship, like, I'm sure we all grew up in families like this, didn't we? Uh, the idea that everyone wants these kind of relationships, that this suits the fat cats at the top of society, because uh, they can get away with paying women less, because they're seen as wives, or mothers, or potential mothers. Uh, it suits the state, who rely on this privatised unit to, to take on all the child rearing, all the domestic labour, uh, and increasingly looking after older relatives. Does it suit working class people? Because I think, regardless of the ideas in people's heads, uh, they, people often don't have the ability to live more sexually kind of free. I don't know whether people actually have the choice all the time to be able to kind of stay or leave a flat that they share uh, with their partner. Um, you know, maybe they can't take on childcare by themselves. Maybe they don't actually just have the time to invest in dating, you know, in seeing other people or, or the rest of it. I think that's why we can have demands in the here and now about sex and sexuality. I actually think we need better housing. I think people need space to have sex. I think it's really hard to have sex if you share with like eight other people. Uh, I think um, 
We need uh, better access to contraception. I think we need abortion uh, on demand. And I think we need better sex education that actually addresses the problems of today. Uh, you know, I want people not just to learn how to have a baby or how not to have a baby. I want them to learn about consent. I want them to learn about LGBT plus relationships. I want them to learn about a clitoris. You know, I want them to learn about the internet and, 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 and revenge porn and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, obviously I've, spent, <laughs> I've pointed out a lot of problems. And <laughs> I think, you know, in these discussions, it's easy to focus on the negative, isn't it? And kind of lose sight of, of the fact that actually sex is really pleasurable. And the kind of human ability to form these complex uh, relationships are part of our humanity. And I think it's relationships that genuinely spark joy for people. It's certainly not housework. You know, it's relationships. Um, <laughs> They provide, uh, you know, often or sometimes the best part of our lives, actually, in what is quite a cruel and demanding world a lot of the time. And I think we need to celebrate the, the, uh, the advances we've had. The fact that you can uh, now sep reliably separate uh, sex from, ch from childbirth for the first time for advances in, in contraception is something uh, to, be, to be celebrated. You know, it's quite easy to forget, actually, that the pill was only allowed to unmarried women 52 years ago. Um, in this, <laughs> when I was doing the research for this meeting, I looked at uh, Sheer Heights, like groundbreaking report, on women's uh, sexuality that she released in 1976. And it was um, revolutionary at the time, actually, to assert the needs of, of women's sexuality so strongly. But this kind of summed it up for me. Whoever doubted that women could have orgasms was wrong and was definitely a man. And actually the idea that uh, women had agency, they had needs, they, you know, and they were able to kind of articulate them, uh, you know, was really important. But I think since then, we've actually seen uh, a bit of a rolling back of some of these attitudes, actually. We've seen the emergence of raunch culture, which has co-opted uh, and absorbed and uses the language of, of these liberation movements of past. I think, it's, I think it is right that women fought so hard uh, to be taken seriously, uh, uh, like women like Shea Height. So... Is this liberation? Do we have it now? Is it, do we live in a more sexually liberated society now because things like Love Island exist? Does Love Island flow from the demands of socialists and feminists uh, who argued actually for an openness to sex, for, for it to be sort of at the forefront of, of, of their movement? Actually, I think it's the opposite. I don't think Love Island reflects a, a more openness to sex. I think it partly reflects how society regulates sexuality, actually, because it only presents a very 2D, surface-level uh, sexuality for what, just one type of person. Um, the whole thing is about its exclusivity. It's about the assurance that individuals can have exclusive access for each other. Uh, I don't think it's a welcome development that men are objectified in a similar way uh, to women. This is what some people argue, that because you know, men are just wearing shorts, you know, as well as women being in bikinis, this is a good thing. I don't think that's a step forward. I don't want equal objectification. I want no objectification. Um, I don't think this represents real freedom, genuine sexual liberation, and real choice, but actually the exact opposite. But I have to say, I think Love Island is popular because it is genuinely really compelling. Like, it is like addictive, isn't it? Like, and uh, people are interested in how relationships work. And frankly, when you've been at work and you come home and you're tired, it's quite nice to sort of worry about someone else's problems and mm -hmm. then kind of uh, think about your own. Uh, I'm not interested in using this meeting as a stick to beat people with who watch Love Island or use dating apps, because I've done both <laughs> and I'm all right. Uh, but more as, a <laughs> more as a process of kind of looking at how society takes all our needs and desires and it makes money off them. So they can sell us subscription fees to dating services based on how we'll find our soulmates, or they can entice us to spend uh, hours on our laptops at home watching other people have sex. Because uh, it's not socialists actually who have a problem with sex, it's the right wing. They want it to be seen as an exclusive activity for a certain type of person and a certain type of relationship. But it's not, it's not shameful, is it? You know, it's not embarrassing. Like, sex is natural. And we want people to be more free uh, in all areas of their life, not just uh, in, this, in their sex lives. And I think this fight for genuine sexual liberation is so important. 
But I don't think the ultimate goal is better sex under capitalism. Like, yeah, definitely, like, better sex under capitalism, but that can't be our end point, because actually capitalism, it won't deliver the type of change that we need. Not only will it not deliver it, it will ruin it, like, like it did with raunch culture. It will co-opt our language, co-opt our politics, co-opt our movement, twist it, and then tell, tell, tell us it's what we, we, we asked for. We actually want a world where people, where ordinary people have a say over themselves, over their lives, and over the way they, for, they form a relationship. And that has to mean the end, um, the end of capitalism. But I think ultimately, we have to remember that the ultimate goal is a, is a socialist society, actually, where people have the ability, they have the choice, and they have the freedom to live exactly as they choose. Here. Me. Yeah. <laughs> do I need to? Do I need to? Okay. Uh, first of all, I thank Sarah for uh, such an entertaining meeting um, and a really relevant meeting actually. I mean, you spoke at the beginning about how popular Love Island is and I uh, watch Love Island every single night, um, <laughs> apart from last night because I was here, of course. Um, <laughs> and I mean, and what a big business it is too. Sarah, um, you know, sort of mentioned about the sponsorship deals that Love Island has. Love Island is sponsored by Uber Eats. I think this is, which is like a food delivery, a fast food delivery company. And I thought the other night, if I ate fast food every night that I watched Love Island, I would never look like one of these people. Ever. So a very confusing message. Actually, you sit on your sofa and consume in more ways than one while watching these sort of um, stereotypically beautiful people. Um, I mean, Sarah's spoken you know, about how similar they all look to one another, but actually any difference between them is picked out. This year there's a contestant on Love Island called Anna. She was in the red swimsuit in the, not this picture, the other picture that Sarah showed, um, who is probably a size 10 uh, and has been criticised, or at least pointed out and highlighted, the fact that she is the curvy one on Love Island. <laughs> which you can imagine makes people feel pretty shit indeed. Um, but it is an escapism, isn't it, that Sarah talks about coming home and wanting to flop and actually watch something um, as entertaining um, as that. But actually, in Love Island, there is a big focus on controversy, around sex, around love and romance. But what happens at the end of virtually every series is the couple who comes out on top are the ones who are most family-friendly, nicest, the ones who get on and they're friends. And so actually incredibly confusing messages that still that dominance of the couple who are the people, you know, she's the girl, she's the girl next door, he said last year um, about Danny, about Danny, who was the, in the winning couple. That actually, you can talk about sex as much as you want, but as if you need to be part of a couple who look very much like the 2.4 children family at the end of it, and that's the only way that you are going to win. Hello, uh, I wanted to bring up the aspect of sexual repression that I think plays into this in that we are directed to places like Pornhub and Love Island because there's very few alternatives because in a highly sexually repressed society where we're not allowed to dis discuss sex openly, where else are you supposed to learn about it? That's it. Yeah, I don't think uh, the speaker did this or anybody in the room did this, but I think you do have to be really careful with this kind of programme not to kind of ridicule either the people that are in it or actually uh, the people uh, that are watching it. Because as you said, these programmes are very popular because sometimes I feel it can be a bit like taking the PR people that read The Sun, for example, like they're all thick, you know, which is absolutely not true. I'm not saying anybody said this, but it's like, you know, people don't always swallow what they watch on the TV or what they read in the papers. For example, you know, there's that very good example of The Sun and Hillsborough, you know, when it went too far and it said on the front page that fans had urinated on the dead. You know, The, the Sun's never been uh, sold or bought in, in Liverpool since then. And I have watched a bit of Love Island. I don't watch it every night. But my daughter, who's 23, youngest one, you know, she absolutely 
uh, kind of loves it. And uh, it can be very brutal, like you say, and the competitive nature of it. And it is a very serious thing, because the last two years, I understand that two contestants that have been in the programme have actually committed suicide. I don't know if that was connected uh, to being on the programme. And of course, as you said and the speaker said, you know, it's a very alienated society we live in. The prospects for young people are pretty poor. You know what I mean? I don't blame anybody really in some ways for trying to make a quick buck, if you like, out of the programme. But the other interesting thing that's happened, I don't know if I'm out of date with this, but there's two guys on there, Curtis and Tommy, and there's some kind of romance, as they call like developing between them. And I did watch it on Facebook, I admit, the kind of scene where they were kind of talking. They had this like kind of heart to heart, and they were saying they were like brothers, and they really got on, and they had a Kiss, right? And I was all very chaste and all the rest of it. But Twitter went alive after that, saying that actually Curtis and Tommy should couple up and they should win the fifty thousand pounds, you know. So it was like a complete contradiction. To, sorry to what you know, the people that are watching it. They're the people that are alive with Twitter, saying actually the, them two guys should win it as a couple, and not all the people that look the same and act the same. Hi, okay, I don't, I definitely agree with what the last speaker said, and I don't want to be a buzzkill and stop people from enjoying what they enjoy. But recently, a friend from work for her birthday got us all tickets to go and see Magic Mike at the Hippodrome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's not my usual sort of hangout. But anyway, but the film Magic Mike is quite interesting because it's about all these kind of um, male strippers who feel really alienated and objectified and they're all kind of on drugs to kind of manage it all when they're really, really miserable and the main character, played by Tranum Tatum, just wants to make enough money to open his carpentry business. So I thought, this is interesting, how are they going to turn this into a sort of stage show? But I thought, my friend's got me a ticket, I'll go along. So I'll go along and um, it's a female compare who's a normal looking woman and she basically talks about how liberating and how brilliant it is to be here and we're all beautiful women and we should all be proud of our sexuality, all good and talks about how sort of this is what the suffragettes won for us and I'm starting to get a little bit dubious. Anyway, these guys, these sort of hairless, um, obviously half naked um, guys covered in baby oil all come up and they all start swinging from poles and they all start jumping on us shoving their groins in our faces. Women that were quite small, they were grabbing them, picking them up, lying them on the floor, forcing their legs open, um, forcing um, women's faces into their groins, um, putting their face in women's all in public. And I thought, is this really kind of liberating? And is this really kind of what we're, we kind of what we fought for? And I thought, no, not really. And another thing from work said, oh, was it good, Nikki? I'm thinking of bringing my daughter. She really enjoys sort of watching men half naked gyrating around. And I said, yeah, fair enough. I said to her, this is what they did there. She said, I don't think I'd actually want to bring my 19 year old daughter and have sort of men all over her sort of forcing her face into their groin. And my daughter, just to go back to Love Island again, I don't want to be a buzzkill again, but my daughter from when she was 10, she's 12 now, she went out with a group of friends and they were all talking about Love Island and their 10 year olds, their parents are letting them watch it from working class and middle class families. I said it was quite sort of sexual and quite distorted sexuality. I'm not sure that's great. Anyway, so now she's at secondary school and she said she wants to look like time her ears are like bleeding because all her friends do is talk about Love Island. And we watched five seconds of it the other night when I was switching over and it was two women helping this man um, wax his bottom by forcing his bum crack open. And fair play to all of you that enjoy this television. I think we do have to question it a little bit. And also if our children are watching it, if young men and women who are impressionable are watching it, sit down with them and just talk to them a bit about it because it's so distorting and it isn't progressive and it is quite damaging to young people. Well, I have to admit, I haven't actually seen Love Island, but I've learned a lot. But what I have learned is what you were saying about how really it presents a very sexualised view of people but then limits it within the constraints of society as is because it seems to me the ultimate thing is to end up in a couple yeah. to end up with one person mm. which is the norm that's presented to us isn't it and i think this stems from how society is organized the property relations of capitalism about individual <coughs> ownership this ownership of your partner but also how it's an escape from the world i like actually watching uh, first dates and you get the backstory of people and all the bad things that have happened to them and everything but everything will be okay if you meet one person. Mm. And this is the problem, isn't it? Because it means all the problems of society that are created by capitalism are put onto one relationship, which by the way, we pointed out, it makes you know, love and sex have to be related, which they don't always actually have to be related. But 
and that's what we were just talking about. But you know, he puts all those pressures to one relationship to solve, and actually, that family that Sarah shows can be a very dangerous place then for women. Actually, mm. you know, this is where most abuse happens. Two women are murdered a week as you're trying to take all that pressure in one place. Um, and I just think, as well, um, what was I going to say? Well, have I got time or not? One more minute. Okay, the idea of a couple as well and the question of monogamy, which is taken as a norm still, even though people are challenging it rightly, is something that didn't always exist throughout the ages, but actually something, again, that as class society develops, it becomes very important to know that how wealth is passed on, how it's inherited, so female sexuality has to be regulated again. This is enforced and socially constructed. <coughs> and my final point is, some of these are drawn out by the revolutionary Alexandra Kollontai, who was writing the Russian Revolution, but she pointed <coughs> out, hmm, Every time there's a revolutionary upsurge, these questions of uh, sexual and love come to the fore. And what she was pointing out is that there's are many other ways of having relationships and things like that that are explored when people are involved in much bigger struggles and transformation of society. She was clear. She said the movement really has to fight for better, and she called the more joyful relations between people. We have to do that in the here and now, but ultimately you have to tear up class society, which imposes these norms from the property relations and everything else, and tear that up in revolutionary struggle that will help transform our relations as well. Love Island and it's also really interesting to watch Love Island through Twitter and to watch the debates that actually come up it's not just you know like someone else said dumb people watching Love Island and not actually being aware of stuff that's happening in it so the stuff about the fact that black women don't get picked as much the fetishization of the mixed race men and the slut shaming that goes towards the women and not towards the men are all brought up on Twitter and debated about it and um, the speaker mentioned Mora, who was very open about talking about sex, and the guy she was coupled up with was like, oh, let's see if she's all talk or not, mm. as if, because mm. she talks about it, she obviously wants to have sex mm. with him. And she completely told him, no, that's not what I want, and you can go away, and she mm. basically dumped him. And it was brought up on Twitter, and there was obviously men saying, oh, well, she talks about it, so she can't really say anything, and the women replying on Twitter going, no, because she talks about it doesn't mean she wants it, and it does open up a debate, and while Love Island obviously isn't the best example of sexuality, you know, it does open up debates on Twitter, and it gets people talking about things that they wouldn't normally talk about. So. I also watch Love Island, and I will say now, I will say now, I do as I watch it, like underneath, just sexual relations and the class struggle, just in my eyes all the time. Because I mean, you know, as the um, comrade said before me, there are so many issues within it. Like I think the one that really um, spoke to me this se this season is where there's a couple, Lucy, and I think I can't remember the guy's name, but he had a problem with her being friends with a man yeah. um, because they had he had this man had expressed um, sexual um, attraction attraction to this woman. And it, perfectly highlights the kind of possessiveness that, you know, a hundred years ago, um, Colin Ty was talking about. She was talking about how we have to be everything to each other, we have to be, you know, the one soulmate to each other, and we have to have every single bit of, of, of a person. You have to have all their time, all their thoughts, everything. All that, even their other relationships are monopolised by the relationship that you're in. Um, the second thing I really wanted to talk about was that um, I think the importance of this meeting. Um, I think that um, these these issues are not kind of um, a distraction. You know, sexual relations are not a distraction because they have such a massive impact on people's lives. They are honestly the thing that, you know, can get you up in the morning, but also can make you want to stay in bed for four years. Um, and I think that if we don't talk about that this is revolutionaries and we're not open about it, it can distract us from, you know, the revolution, not distract, but it can be a distraction from the revolutionary struggle. And I think that Colin Ty really talked about that. She was like, oh, to be, to be honest, I've got no time to fall in love. And uh, obviously Emma said that in, the, uh, in her meeting on Colin Ty. And I think that, you know, another, and I don't think any other group on the left would do this. I think that it's so important that we um, talk about this as revolutionaries and as, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I also watch Love Island. Um, I just want to talk because obviously, as you said, there are so many sponsors and they need to keep the viewership 
and the way they do that is by like having drama constantly. But this is really dangerous for the contestants themselves. Mm -hmm. Like Comrade over here touched on the suicides, mm -hmm. uh, and especially because they they are not allowed music, they're not allowed books, and it's you know 24 hours of their life condensed down into an hour, mm -hmm. and it's the way that the producers and the editors manipulate yeah. the events uh, to kind of create a kind of constant narrative, and that combined with social media, like especially like Twitter, Instagram, all of that. Some contestants should get absolutely ripped to shreds on that. Their lives can be, you know, somewhat destroyed, and it can have really adverse mental health, you know, um, consequences for them. And I think that's like one of the most important things to bear in mind when you are consuming reality TV, like Love Island, Big Brother, that kind of thing. glamorous thing so I think it's okay to enjoy Love Island and I think it's a product of the society we live in like you say the capitalist society um, I think I can enjoy it and I can look at it from a critical perspective because I have been <coughs> on the subject um, but um, I think it's really important to educate in the now if you are going to enjoy it but also maybe with, like you have to move towards a society that products like this aren't created as a response to the social climate we live in where these are the circumstances people fall in love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, I don't watch Love Island, I've watched one episode and I really, really don't like it. But, <laughs> I do watch Towing. I just I, I just get so into it. I think what I've seen in the last few series though, they've tried to plug uh, like sort of campaigns like, oh let's not wear any makeup or like, let's talk about like, our, like mental health and stuff, which is great, but then it's polarised with the fact that they all still wear makeup and they all still have all this plastic surgery and obviously like it's your choice whether to have plastic surgery or not, but at the same time if you're doing that because you're, you're feeling the pressure of you know being famous or whatever, then those girls must be confused, but then it's on TV, so what's it actually doing to you know, normal girls, real girls, who, who are you know, not a size 8 and hate themselves? Um, but then, aside from that, sort of, I know this is about like, relationships, but then the way that uh, the relationships are portrayed, especially in Taui, affects the relationships the girls have with each other, and they fight and they scream at each other, they call each other the worst names, which then opens the door for the men to then call them that. You know, they call each other you know, the B word, the C word, all the words, because it's... It's like push into them, that they have to compete with each other for the spotlight to be the prettiest, for the, for the men, for everything. So, you know, capitalism doesn't just, you know, ruin our relationships with our, you know, loving partners. I think it's also having a massive effect on the, the way that women treat each other as well. Yeah. You know, we can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, this whole meeting and discussion got me thinking about my secondary school teacher. Um, about there's a new uh, relationships and sex education uh, kind of you know top down coming into schools and interestingly they've changed it from sex and relationships education education to relationships and sex education um, which is an interesting distinction they made with the language but um, it really worries me that you know we are um, with shows like Love Island we need space I think in schools particularly to talk about these things yeah. but we're in a situation at the moment where we are so overworked as teachers uh, and we're having to teach this on top of our other responsibilities and I'm concerned that we're not going to have the time to um, include these kind of discussions in you know, what we do in schools and particularly linking it to mental health again. There was a report that came out a few weeks ago about the number of young girls who are self-harming because of body image um, and I think it's really important that as teachers and you know, parents particularly in the current climate, what's been happening around LGBT education in school. This is a very contested subject, um, and there is a lot of work, I think, to be done building. In the union, I know that we're, there are discussions around this, but I think it's really important that we pull this kind of discussion into what is happening in, in workplaces, particularly in schools. Hi, 
I do watch Love Island, but I do have like a weird obsession with first dates, but that's not actually what I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> I um, so like I think it's interesting that we talk about how Love Island represents for us like what people what sorry what the like what the state wants to see in society in terms of relationships. But I actually think that uh, dating show that we haven't talked about, which represents us even better, is Undateables. Mm. Undateables, like as a disabled woman, I find it utterly disgusting that idea but like they're exploiting like oh look at this kid with like learning difficulties oh he's got a girlfriend who also has learning difficulties because apparently like if you're an able-bodied person you can never find a disabled person attractive and I think it's something that's just been accepted by society because the way that we fetishize the disability is like we find it adorable or like cute but these people are like getting on with their lives yeah. and I just really think that it's the worst for me like personally the worst thing show because it's on a whole level of like segregating society in a way that's completely accepted as entertainment. Very good. Um hello everybody. Um so I was basically tying in with what society on sea relationships look like. But also, because I run um, a shop and members of staff, they love watching this non-stop. I asked them recently, would they still watch it, given its pride this weekend, if everybody on the show was gay? Mm. Or if it was solely women, for example? Because the only shows I can think of where she discussed that was um, L Word, for example, or there was one on Beast on Beast 2 that was um, about gay men. But if we put mm. this actually out there as something which people can do and end up happy with, what does that start saying about actual LGBT? Um, visibility, because if you see in programs and films, if the main character is gay, they end up dying, <coughs> or and that would never have a successful happy ending for people of that line, which is quite quiz quiz too. I feel like we're in the AA meeting, I too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and done all the dating apps and everything. Um, I was a bit apprehensive this talk because I sometimes it feels like your TV judgments and we talked a little bit about yesterday when we came to the meetings about music are judged on your character and this idea of escapism and who you really are and if you like this and then you become this. But I think it's also not to be so doom and gloom, there are some amazing people that are challenging these stereotypes in these industries. And we talked about this mindless campaign of just these women protecting these are all real people and they are not dictionary made up robots, they're real people. Porn stars are real people and there are people, there's an amazing woman, I think her name is Rosa in Spain, and she's trying to like completely revamp the um, Spanish porn industry with giving the rights back to porn stars and does full length films where she doesn't interrupt and there's just things like that. Also protecting sex workers I think is also a really important question because we bring in the idea of something being so over sexualized so how do we deal in one of the most sexualized industries and protect those people as well, as well as protect <coughs> our mental health? So I think it just brings up really good conversations, but remembering it's not just telling our children, this is bad, don't watch it, this will harm you. Mm -hmm. Having conversations, letting them see it. I think a lot of the times when you cover it and just give it this label, you don't allow children to like explore and see actually what is really out there. So um, not only just conversations, but exploring people who are actually doing some of this work to overturn mm -hmm. things that we would like to see in the future. Yeah, um, I do watch it off and on. Like you can leave it for two days and come back and you know what exactly is happening, so it's kind of fine. Um, I think the point I wanted to make is the question of when people couple up and this automatic ownership of the person they're in a couple with. And I think it's quite interesting, like this year was the massive praise of that um, show on Netflix called You, where the guy is so obsessed with the woman and like he literally murders someone for her. And people on Twitter are like, that's so romantic. Like he kills someone for her. And it just, it shows how screwed up it is. And it's just like, I think mean, what it does really that show is like, um, there's a bit where she doesn't have curtains and he's watching her from the street and he masturbates. But there's like, it's actually this disgusting, but what it does, it goes 
from the gender um, rom-coms that you grow up with when there are scenes of guys like watching a woman from across the street and you're made to, as a kid, think, oh, that's romantic and it's like this level of obsession which is absolutely disgusting. Um, and I also wanted to talk about the festicization and like the racism of like Viola, the treating of like black women in it. Like, there's always that one token one and when there was like a couple of more that came in this year, everyone was completely shocked. It's like, oh, there's more black women, what is going on here? Um, and I think this, that thing on like um, the porn industry where there's this festicization of Muslim women to the extent where the Muslim <coughs> women are having sex whilst wearing their headscarf, which is like, that's, that's, it doesn't even happen, like, what? <laughs> it's like, it's like the level people go to to fetishize individuals, and I think it's like, it shows how, like, our ideas of relationships and so forth are so screwed up by the world in which we live in, and I think, like, we are, like, we do always challenge it, but we're not always automatically immune to it because it's so deeply ingrained in us at such a young age. And I think, like, as socialists, we always have to question it and always be a part of it, but also be aware, very aware, like, we live in this world <coughs> where not automatically, like, our ideas are not immune from the material world in which we live in. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. But we can change it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have long, so I'm just going to come back on a couple of points. I think um, Love Island has actually raised some really important questions about relationships mm. in society. Not, not obviously, not just in this room, uh, but on Twitter, like in, in um, you know, in the in the newspapers and so on. Um, last year, there was um, a really good discussion and reaction to um, the treatment of a contestant called Adam over the way he treated Rosie, a fellow contestant. And it raised a really interesting uh, discussion around the question of gaslighting. You know, like he was just he was just being essentially kind of abusive to her and just denying the fact that she had her well her take on the situation, that she had any right to be upset and things like that. He just told her it was all her fault and things like that. Or like Lucy and Joe this year, like people have, have talked about uh, you know, he didn't like the fact that she was friends uh, with, with a man. But I, I actually think, although it's important to talk about these, uh, quite, these individual incidents, I, I think we need to move beyond that as well and think, you know, it's, it's sort of in a way doesn't really surprise me that they think they own each other to that level. Do you know what I mean? Because that's kind of the whole uh, uh, premise, premise of, the, of the show and, and reflects, like comrades have talked about, the kind of wider politics um, of society. I, um, just on, on the sort of question of sex work, I think it's absolutely right to talk about the way, ways in which people are, are fighting back. But I feel like I need to say I do think sex work is different from any other job. Um, I don't want any kind of financial yeah. incentive when it comes to sex. Like, I just want people to do it uh, literally because, because they want to and absolutely no other reason. Um, I, I think it's really good that Comrade raised the question about the undateables. Um, I actually have never seen that, so I don't, I, I don't feel qualified to kind of comment on it. Um, but you do find that actually they reflect so strongly the prejudices in wider society. Like, um, you know, like, I mean, honestly, you could do a whole meeting on like racism and dating apps. So, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, actually, like to the extent where Grinder have had to set up a whole campaign called Kinda Grinder, <laughs> which I quite like. Um, uh, you know, actually challenging people on their racism. But in real life, the biggest ethnic group, the, the fastest growing ethnic group, uh, is mixed ethnicity babies. Actually, in real life, people fight those uh, ideas, uh, maybe in a maybe in a slightly easier way, um, they're able to, to, to kind of con confront those ideas. Um, I think I've talked a lot in this meeting about the problems of capitalism, but don't worry, we have a solution. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a bit about the vision uh, for how it could be different, uh, because actually I think it is possible to build a society where relationships between individuals have nothing to do with property, like comrades have talked about. They've got nothing to do about ownership, actually, about owning another ind individ uh, individual. I think people should be able to kind of enter and exit relationships as they see fit. I don't think they should have to have to stay because they can't afford the mortgage uh, and so on. I think a socialist society would actually have people forming relationships in all kinds of different ways. I think if people 
want to have relationships very similar to the ones we see in capitalism, fine, crack on. Like, I want them to be able to, to have the opportunity to do it. But actually, I want a freer society. I want people to have real choice where they can, uh, they can have different types of relationships because I think it's a good thing that in recent years we've seen a flourishing of uh, different sexual identities, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, wanting to d define uh, in different ways and, and wider uh, acceptance of it. I think it's a good thing, actually, that more people are kind of, you know, coming out as polyamorous or, like, saying they want to live or, you know, live or love with several different partners uh, at the same time. But my worry is, is that actually... Uh, under capitalism, because these oppressions are so deeply entrenched, actually these relationships, which appear very, very different on the surface, reflect uh, much of the problems that people have talked about in, in wider society, you know, in, in existing relationships, the, the pressures, uh, the material problems, and stuff like that. So instead of actually living necessarily in a sort of, in, in a completely different way, you kind of just have two relationships that, uh, that, that, that have the similar, pro similar problems. Um, I think this is, a, this is a really important meeting to be having, and I'm really, really, you know, obviously I'm really glad uh, that we're having it. Um, I think we take on these questions really well in the Socialist Workers' Party um, about sex and sexuality, about women's oppression, uh, about culture, um, you know, and so on. Um, because I'm not, I'm not just angry about this or interested. I mean, I know it seems like I'm completely obsessed with sex because I spent an hour talking about it. That's not the case. Uh, I'm not, I'm not just, I don't just care about this. I don't spend my time talking and thinking about sexual relationships and stuff like that. I'm actually angry about everything. I'm angry. <laughs> it's true, actually. I'm, I'm angry about austerity. I'm angry about racism. I'm angry about Palestine. And by the way, the planet's dying. But I think we can change it. And I think Marxism has been a really fantastic discussion uh, of, of different uh, you know, ways we can do that. And I think we need to fundamentally change it. I think we need to work together to fundamentally change it. I, I don't want to repair capitalism. I want it gone. I want us to rip out a system that oppresses us, oppresses us all and pollutes our, and pollutes our world. So we're not a group of sort of like experts kind of in the SWP. And it's been said before, this isn't a kind of... Uh, this isn't a spectator sport. We need to be bigger. I don't just want people to exit this room and agree with everything I've said. I want them to join us. Like, I, I know you've probably all been asked this before, uh, this weekend, but I want you to join the Socialist Workers' Party and join us in fighting for a better world. <laughs>